Welcome to today's virtual presentation, Other Duties as Assigned, Under Provided with Bailey Hutchinson. When I heard Bailey was the keynote speaker at the Iowa Library Association Conference, I knew Nebraska librarians needed to hear her too. Bailey is the branch manager in Altus, Oklahoma for the Southern Prairie Library System. She is also the Vice President, President-Elect for the Association of Rural and Small Libraries, also known as ARSL or ARSL. She is known as Bailey the Librarian and is a celebrity in the TikTok world with more than 11.2 thousand followers. I met Bailey over four years ago in St. George, Utah. We were both scholarship winners attending our very first conference and I am Honored to call Bailey a dear friend, and I am so excited and thrilled to have her with us today. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Tammy, so much for that wonderful introduction. And I am so excited to be here. Good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. Thank you for choosing to start your Monday morning off uh, with this presentation. Hopefully you've already had some coffee or if you're not a coffee drinker, hot tea. I have my cup here with me already. <laughs> uh, so this is going to be a little different since we're doing a Zoom presentation, but I'm sure over the past two years, we've all gotten a little bit more used to attending presentations online and having to figure out that way to still get that personal interaction, even though we're not with each other in the same room. So throughout the talk, I might ask a couple of questions. If you are familiar with using the raise the hand function, you can do that or just type in the chat. Uh, there'll be time at the end for um, interaction and Q&A. And so uh, we will get started. So uh, like I said, I'm just really excited to be speaking with the Three Rivers Library System. Uh, like Tammy said, she's just become a dear friend. I was just telling my husband last night, like, you really do make lifelong friends through ARSL. And I just think through the library world in general, uh, with, we met in uh, St. George and she even surprised me here at my library and out this Oklahoma one time, which was so exciting. And so now I just need to make that same surprise and go to Nebraska. <laughs> and then I can visit some of the wonderful libraries in the system. Uh, so I've never been to Nebraska before. So I really hope to, uh, make that visit someday. Uh, I was doing some checking because I'm always curious what the weather is like in other states. I love snow. If once you get to know me, you know that I love, love snow. And being in Oklahoma, especially Southwest Oklahoma, right no, does Thank not you. happen very often. <laughs> Watching a but Zoom meeting. I realized that uh, it's pretty chilly up there. Uh, I don't know. I know not everybody is in Omaha, the Three Rivers Library System office is in Omaha, is that correct? Okay, so I, I'm assuming the area. Yesterday it was 80 degrees here, and this morning it was 38. So that's kind of like what our weather is like here. Um, so this year, I was able to travel for the first time since the pandemic all started back in February, March, kind of depends on maybe where you're at, maybe when things finally started shutting down. And when I travel, I always really miss my home. And I don't know if you get that same feeling, like it's nice to travel and see new places and meet new people, but I'm sort of a homebody, even though I'm pretty extroverted. And so I always miss my home. But one thing I've noticed since working in libraries is that when I have traveled to library conferences or I've been able to interact with other librarians, whether it's via a Zoom, uh, I just feel at home because I feel like I'm with the people that understand me. They understand what we, what I do every day. I feel like, you know, there's that at home feeling. It's the same feeling that I get when I would go to my grandma's as a kid, like home away from home. So uh, I really appreciate any opportunity I get to be able to um, speak with other librarians and kind of feel at home. So uh, one thing I kind of wanted to get out of the way is uh, I love to talk. <laughs> and so I have to have notes to keep me focused because I can go on rabbit trails. 
And uh, so if you see, I know it's a little different with the Zoom, but if you see me like shuffling paper, I'll try to do it slightly. But so I try to stay focused and not get off on too many rabbit trails. I also um, will get really nervous and sometimes can be really awkward. And so I feel like if I say that out loud, then it helps me feel less nervous. <laughs> But one thing I don't get nervous about, like Tammy mentioned, is making TikToks. Uh, this was one of those things. I remember one of my staff was like, Bailey, you should get on TikTok. I'm like, I'm, I'm too old for that. I'm not getting on TikTok. I, you know, I've heard my nephew who is 14 talk about TikTok and I was like, I'm not getting on TikTok. Well, I decided to get on TikTok <laughs> and I discovered that there are people who work in libraries that are on TikTok and there's book talk and there was all these like really fun things and one thing led to another and I uh, just really enjoy making TikToks. So when I first did this presentation for Iowa, their theme was other duties as a sign. And I was like, ooh, I have to make a TikTok for that. And I did, and I wanna share that with y'all. And then we can, so I'm gonna share the screen. I feel like this is really fancy. Okay. Can everybody see the screen? Thumbs up, okay. Okay, did everybody hear that music as well? Okay, a little bit. Um, so that that TikTok, there, there are trends that go uh, on TikTok. And if you're familiar with the 90s sitcom Full House, that's their theme song. And the trend included uh, either teams or sometimes moms showcasing all the different things that they do. And if you have watched that show, you'll remember how they go around and introduce the staff. And so I, I thought I worked with my staff and we came up with the different roles that sometimes librarians do. I, I'm sure everybody has been that therapist to a patron or even a staff person before and how I've used a plunger in your toilet or had to do some maintenance work on your building. And so it's just kind of a fun way to do that. And so I really enjoy making, I do mostly library content and it's just a fun way to get, uh, to show people the things that we do in a lighthearted way. You know, we're, we're more than just checking out books and we offer so much to the community. So figuring out a way to show that to others is uh, always fun. So this next slide, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about me. Who is this lady talking to you today? <laughs> um, I wanted to, so my name is Bailey and uh, like Tammy said, I'm from Altus, Oklahoma, or that's where I currently live. I'm from Oklahoma and I've lived all over Oklahoma. I've, I've mostly grown up in small and rural communities, like a thousand or less. There was a time where I lived in Tulsa for a few years. And to me, like, wow, that was a huge city. <laughs> uh, and it, I always chuckle when people are like, oh, I live in a small city. And I'm like, oh, where? They're like Dallas. I'm like, that's not small. <laughs> Until you live in a town with like 2,000 or less or even 5,000. We lived in Tennessee for a little bit and it was 5,000. Like, that's, that's small to me. Uh, so I've been married for seven years. Uh, that's my husband in the picture with our family. And we have two beautiful girls, um, Haley and Raylan. Haley's the oldest. She just turned 11 last month. And I'm not even sure how that happened. I mean, the years just fly by. And Raylan is five. She'll be six in February. And then when I first made the slide, my girls were very upset that I did not include our cat and our dog. So I edited the slide to include our cat cuddles and then our golden retriever, Cooper. And um, so though that's just a little bit about our family. And Altus is in Southwest Oklahoma. So truly the plains. Um, and I, I don't know, like, is it pretty flat also in Nebraska? 
I, I don't know if there's a lot of trees. I have not been in Nebraska and I should know my geography better, but uh, where I'm at, I'm not in Southwest Oklahoma, it's flat. Like when people, when I first moved here and people would give me directions to something, they would say like go two miles South and turn left by the tree. And I'm like a tree, like one tree, there's only one tree here. Uh, so I, it took a lot to get used to moving back from Tennessee because I was surrounded by trees and I loved that uh, greenery, but um, I've been the branch manager here for three years. I really, really enjoy it. Uh, and I actually, I was just telling Tammy earlier, I'm in my last week of my master's degree and I get to graduate next week with my master's in library and information studies through the University of Oklahoma. And I'm very, very, very excited. <laughs> um, I know I'm pretty partial, but I just have an amazing family and support group here. Uh, I, since I started working in libraries five years ago, they've been so supportive and my pursuit of my passion in libraries and what that's meant as far as schooling and going to conferences. And, and it's been fun for my kids to also tag along and, and be a part of the programming and different things that we get to do at the library. Uh, so uh, things that I love, there's a lot of things I love, but I love coffee. Love it, love it, love it probably drink too much of it. Um, I love tacos and wine. And depending on the day, kind of depends on the order that that might come in. Just kidding. But uh, uh, I'm like thinking, how in the world did I find myself in libraries? Um, let's see. Oh, there we go. Uh, so I consider myself an accidental librarian. And you might think, okay, well, What's an accidental librarian? This was not my intended career path. If you would have asked me six years ago, if I would ever work in a library, I would have laughed and said, no. One, I'm extremely loud and my idea of a librarian was not loud. And I just had no idea that it was um, such a career path that I've discovered today. And I'm kind of curious, um, I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second. So I'm kind of curious how many of y'all here today would consider yourselves accidental librarians? Like if you stumbled, fell, ran smack dab into it, um, working into the library. And so I see some of y'all waving, have your cameras on, the thumbs up. Yes, you can do the chat box. Uh, so um, yes, me, Brenda says me. All right, so you, you kind of understand like this, this isn't what, you were intending to do and you find yourself in this position. And that's probably been one of my absolute favorite things ever since I attended that conference in St. George and met Tammy. And I, I heard a little bit of her story and about where she was working at the time and heard other people's stories about how they became a librarian um, or came to work at a library, the background that they had. And I just find it fascinating because everything that we bring to the table, I feel like has always applied to how we can work in a library, which is awesome. So I feel like that is the beauty of working in a library. Uh, now, like I said, I've only, well, I've only worked in public libraries, uh, but I feel the same applies for academic and school libraries. Um, and I feel like my journey was sort of an anomaly. Uh, in my undergrad, I majored in psychology I was a mental health case manager at the Tulsa Day Center for the Homeless. And I've had some people say, well, then you have the skills to handle patrons. <laughs> and while yes, it does take a lot of people skills. Um, the, I, I worked there for about three years and I wanted to be a forensic psychologist. And I would have preferred to be on the show Criminal Minds, but since that wasn't a realistic possibility for me, I decided I would just get my master's in forensic psychology. My husband's job moved us to Tennessee. And so I, I was like, that's what I'll do. I'll work my master's while we're here. And the library there in Bolivar, Tennessee had been looking for a director for quite some time. And uh, this is about a, a community of around 5,000. And a lady on the board heard I had a degree and asked if I'd be willing to apply for the director position. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. And so I went home that night and, you know, we're working on getting things moved from Oklahoma to Tennessee. And 
I do what I think every good librarian does now um, is I Googled librarian cover letter. <laughs> I was like, what, what does it mean to <laughs> apply for a library director position? <laughs> and my husband wasn't too happy about this because it was about 1 a.m. And I like shake him awake. I'm like, honey, do you realize people have careers in this? Like they go to school for this. Like there's so much you can do. You can be a children's librarian or a teen librarian. And I just thought like my world busted wide open with all of these possibilities that I, and I'm embarrassed to admit now I had no idea about my mind of what working in a library meant was I thought um, that I could just check it books in and out and work on my master's and have a place to do my homework quietly. And that was about it. So uh, that quickly changed. Uh, I did apply for that job. And I, I still to this day keep in touch with some of the board members there because I will forever be grateful for the opportunity they gave me because I realized the opportunity to become a director at a library with zero library experience and um, no, degree that some libraries I now realize require uh, was just an anomaly for me. Um, and so I absolutely fell in love with what I did. My <laughs> first week there, um, I got bombarded with all of those other duties as a sign. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, what was really neat is in when we lived in Tulsa the summer before we moved to Tennessee. So I knew that I was going to be working at this library. We had already visited there a couple of times and it was going to be a few months before we moved. I was staying at home. I just had my youngest and we lived like two blocks from one of the Tulsa public library branches and we would walk up there. And I was amazed. That's when I realized they had like these PlayStations for kids. And of course, we're talking, this was a really big library and they did have a lot available, but I just was blown away. We signed up for a summer reading program and I have to show this little picture of my daughter and her first time completing summer reading program. Let's see if it goes. This is Haley <laughs> and this is, she was five years old and it was, so when I grew up in small rural towns, that there never was a public library. Cause I started talking to my mom and I was like, mom, I don't remember us participating in summer reading programs or going to a library. And we started thinking back to all the places we lived and none of them had a public library. We utilized our school library a lot. So I didn't have that experience that I've heard from so many people. Um, growing up the importance that their public library had in their life. And so Haley was so, I mean, she, this is when she fell in love with reading. Now I've always read, we had books in our house, we love reading, but it was because of people like you that take the time to pour into our kids coming in or pour into their staff that pours into our kids. Um, she fell in love with reading. So that was one of her prizes she won was the little uh, blow up bat. And, and uh, it was just really neat to then in a few months to start working in a library because I got to see firsthand the difference that it made in my family's life. So the first week on the job, I was told I would have a whole new board. Uh, I think nobody but one of the board members had served on a library board before um, that I had to get this technology grant in and um, and what, oh, and that there was gonna be an audit that I had to help complete. <laughs> and I, I was like, I think maybe because, you know, ignorance is bliss sometimes. <laughs> I think because I hadn't gone through those things, I thought, okay, well, we'll figure it out. Sometimes I can be annoyingly positive and until I'm like, oh, whoa, an audit. <laughs> now, that, that was a big task. And so uh, that led me to ask, okay, so what else am I expected to do? And of course we had several conversations in our interview and stuff, but then I really, I think through the whole process, I still did not understand what this was going to uh, mean for me. And so I got the job description and at the very bottom, uh, there were those words, other duties as assigned. <laughs> I literally had no idea what I was doing. And um, I've said this before, and I will say it, 
a million times more, but there's absolutely no way I could have gotten through those first couple of, well, those two years that I was there without the association of rural and small libraries. Now I had a great supportive board and we were part of a regional system as well. And I had a great uh, supportive regional system office that supplied, or, uh, supplied a lot of support. But when I heard about this organization, and like we said, that's where I met Tammy. We, that's when I first heard about it was this conference and we can apply for a scholarship. I actually thought it was spam. <laughs> so I thought, are there really library conferences? Do like librarians really go to conferences? I'm telling you, my world was just completely changed back in 2016. <laughs> uh, and I realized that, that it wasn't spam. It's a real organization. I applied for the scholarship, received it and knew I was going to intend in the meantime, I took advantage of their listserv. And I, when I say I took advantage of it, I probably sent multiple questions a day, so much so that I became known as listserv Bailey because I, I just, every time I'm like, well, how do you handle this staff problem? How do I submit a grant? How do I write, uh, how do I write a grant? How do I do a budget? I mean, I had some supervisory experience, but I did not have any knowledge of the inner workings of a library. And thankfully I had an amazing staff there that kept just the day-to-day -day things going. Um, but as far as interacting with the board and talking to our city council and our county commissioners and all of these things and, and doing programming, um, they did not have any programming going on. So it was really easy to make it look like we were doing something, but just organize all the things that are involved. Uh, and what I received was overwhelming responses of either answers, just support, just, hey, thank you for asking that question because I was wondering the same thing, but I didn't want to ask the question because I didn't want to seem silly. And I'm like, oh, don't you worry. I'm the person that just says everything I'm thinking out loud and hopefully somebody else can relate. <laughs> um, and so what I found was a community. And now I have found that community through my state association. I feel like anytime I meet another fellow librarian, it's just been the first time in my adult life where you just meet other people that I feel like just understand and they're there to support you and step up. So uh, that helped me get through my first two years. So that, that was my uh, welcome to becoming a director here uh, at Bolivar Hardeman County Library. So what... What are those, and I know I keep going back and forth between sharing my screen, but what are those other duties as a sign? Uh, I just want you to take a couple seconds, minute to look over the words in this word cloud. So as I was preparing for this presentation in Iowa, and I knew that this was the theme of their conference, I reached out to my favorite people, ARSL Listserv, and I asked, what are some other duties as assigned that you have done in your profession? And I want to point out, I, I think there's pig in there somewhere. And I want to explain that because <laughs> it was actually somebody from Iowa who wrestled a guinea pig that got out in their library. And pig was somehow the word that showed up in the word cloud. Um, I was just curious, what are all the hats that they wear? And I wasn't disappointed. My email was flooded with responses. And I, I really wish I had the time to read all of them because they came in paragraphs, some came in bulleted list. Um, some brought tears to my eyes. Some made me laugh so hard that I cried. <laughs> and some, man, I just, I never felt more seen and understood. So I gathered all of these responses the best that I could and put the keywords into a word cloud. And this is what it produced. And as you can see, plumber is a big one. Uh, I remember one day I was probably about a month in at the library in Tennessee a patron comes to my office and tells me I need to go look at the women's restroom. And I thought, okay, no big deal. I walk into some standing water and a toilet overflowing, and I will spare you the details of the contents I saw floating past me, uh, but nothing prepared me for this. 
not even having babies prepared me for this. Um, I quickly run to the front desk and ask the staff, um, who is the plumber that you guys call or who do I call over at the city? Because the we were partly owned by the city, partly owned by the county. It was kind of a, a, a weird dynamic. And so I wasn't quite sure who was who and what was what yet. And uh, my one of my staff uh, looked at me and she just kind of laughed and she said, you. I said, what do you what do you mean me? And she said, yep. Uh, and one of my other staff quickly came up and she handed me a plunger. And I was like, and I think maybe they were chuckling because they had been without a director for a while. So I'm sure that they have handled these problems themselves many a times. And maybe they were finally relieved that somebody else was there to handle that problem. <laughs> so I took a deep breath and I said, okay, I'm not going to lose it in front of them. I've only been here a month and I'm going to go take care of this problem. And I grabbed a bucket and a mop too. And we went in there and, you know, I plunged and eventually the water went down and I was able to get somebody from the city and they had to snake the drain and all of that stuff. But I realized really quickly that there was much more to this position than checking out books. And I remember going home that day and, you know, we're eating dinner. I was like, guess what I did today? My husband's like, check out a book. I said, no, I used a plunger and un clogged a toilet all by myself. I said, I am practically a plumber now. And he chuckled and he said, oh good. Well, now I know who to call when we need help here. And I was like, ah, that's not funny. <laughs> but I felt very proud. So I was like, I, you know, we did this and we worked together and got it done. <laughs> so custodian, teacher, manager, programmer, designer, IT, social worker, therapist, historian, marketing, accountant, repair. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And I had a friend ask me, I mean, do people really come into the library anymore? And I chuckled because I remember thinking the same thing a few years ago. And I also remember like, that's what I need to show grace to other people because they obviously don't know. So what can we do to get that word out that people do come into the library and they do need our services? And I told her about a guy who had come in about a month prior to this. And this was before, this is probably my first year here in Altus when this happened. And uh, she, he came in and asked to use one of our public computers. We signed him on, he gets on. And I could tell he was uh, pretty frustrated. Um, he came to the front desk about 10 minutes later, nearly in tears. Uh, I asked him if he was okay. And he proceeds to tell me that uh, he has lost his job and he has to apply for this new job, but all of it is online and he's never done that before. And so he was really frustrated because he kept getting booted out of the system that he had to apply on. And he was trying, you know, he said, I have to upload a resume and I just tell he was really frustrated. So uh, I uh, went over there. We helped him through that process. I had another staff come and help him build his resume online to where he could then upload it to the software that he was applying through a job for. And it, it took quite a bit of time, but he got finished. He was super great, grateful and he left. Well, about two months later, like I, I completely forgot about that this happened. About two months later, he comes in and I'm at the front desk and he's really smiling. I'm like, oh yay, a happy patron. <laughs> Not that we don't always have happy patrons, but you know, sometimes you don't have happy patrons. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, ask, ask how I can help him today. And he's like, do you remember me? And I said, your face looks very familiar. Yes. He was like, I was in here a couple months ago and I applied for a job and y'all helped me. And I just wanted to let you know, I got the job and I'm working now. And, you know, he went on to kind of tell us more about his situation. And I, I don't know, this story kind of brings tears to my eyes every time. So I just, we don't always get to see that outcome. We don't always know the impact that we have on our patrons' lives, but that moment we did, and that impact was huge. And so that moment of being able to provide this service to a patron that truly impacted him and his family's life moving forward made a difference. And my friend was floored. And I said, that's just one drop in the bucket though. That's just one story. We help kids discover reading. We help, you know, adults learn how to use a computer. I mean, there's so many different services that our libraries offer that we do that patrons come in for every single day. And I think sometimes I even forget all that we do 
because we get so used to doing it and it just seems normal for us. And I think those who maybe don't use our public library on a daily basis forget how important it is. And that became really evident when so many of us had to shut down a couple of years ago. Um, so as if there isn't already so many aspects to our job, 2020 happened and libraries across the world had to pivot in a big way. And I'll, I'm gonna share this. this. This was my funny meme for the presentation. I don't, I don't know if we have any Friends fans out there, but this was kind of an iconic episode and the Friends where they're moving and he's yelling pivot. And this was a, a meme I saw a lot during 2020 as libraries were having to pivot. And I don't know about you, but I'm still trying to process March, 2020. That's, that's when our library shut down was um, March in 2020. My last conference, I was at PLA in Nashville. Uh, that was the end of February. I think I got home March 1st and we had already been hearing kind of rumbles of what was going on. And I, I look back and it almost feels like a movie. I'm like this, this really happened. And my kid's school was going out for their spring break. And, and we heard, okay, well, they're going to go out a few days early, but we'll come back. They're going to be out just one more week. We'll, we'll come back. Okay, they're going to be out for the rest of school year. Our library is fully shutting down. We need to figure out how we're going to still provide services to our patrons and keep ourselves safe and keep our staff employed and being able to pay them and do all the things. Whoa. So... I'm sure all of y'all have been affected by that in some way, whether you were the one having to make all those decisions or whether you were the one on the other end, just waiting to find out how that was going to look for you, look like for you. Um, where was that in the job description? <laughs> Cause that wasn't in the job description. Um, and surely this isn't a part of the other duties as assigned. Um, I know the shutdown looked different for many people across the United States. I had, um, library friends who never closed. They kept their doors open and maybe their services looked a little different. And then I still have friends even as um, like this summer that were still closed down to the public and they were just doing curbside and stuff like that. And so um, I know it's looked different. We, we, for us personally, we shut down in March. Our staff came back in May and we opened back up into the public of June, 2020. Now our serve, we had no programming, no in-person programming. Uh, we had a come and go uh, atmosphere is what we were trying to encourage as far as patrons coming and going really quickly, very limited computer access. So it still was really different. Um, so we had to pivot in a big way. We had to pivot how we did programming. Storytime was one of our main children's programs. We have it every Wednesday at 11 with a craft. And now I'm doing Facebook Live and I have never done Facebook Live. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, all the dynamics on how do I do this? And is there a copyright issue here? And many of you are in small rural libraries and don't have that staff capacity. Like I had some librarian friends in bigger libraries that had people specifically working on all the copyright issues and then telling their staff what they can do. And I'm like, I don't have that capacity. We, we don't have that many people to do all these different things. We only have a few people. We have to figure out how to do it all at one time. And so it was a lot. Uh, I remember one of the very first times doing Facebook Live, I had a stack of books about this high on my bathroom sink because my bathroom had the best lighting. I didn't have a ring light or anything. And I had a really pretty shower curtain. So it was a good background. And I'm trying to do story time while my kids are also trying to do school and I'm trying to keep them, you know, from not fighting. And, and then I, it took me a couple of weeks before I realized that there was a setting on Facebook. You could flip the book around to where the book read the correct way from the screen. And I also remember one time I'm doing story time and you know, like, and this is when you know that everybody's just trying to survive. I think I have the book up. Like, I think I have it up and I'm getting onto my girls off to the side because they were just kind of at each other's throat. My, my staff member texted me and she said, Hey, you be nice to those girls. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, Oh, everybody saw you getting onto them. Your book was not covering your mouth. <laughs> I was like, 
oh, okay. Good thing is, is everybody showed us all grace. <laughs> so uh, just a little story of how we were just trying to figure it out. And, and all the while making decisions on how to best keep yourself safe, your staff safe, your patrons safe. There was everything that we had to do. And so um, there, I'm sure there was a lot of ways y'all had to pivot. Um, and I um, constantly was thinking that how do we get, because so many of our community being in a rural area didn't have access to the internet or maybe they didn't have Wi-Fi at their house. So they couldn't, because we had all, you know, we're like, you can access our overdrive or our online books, or you can access all these resources. Well, if they don't have the ability to access it, then there's this great digital divide. So then there's that worry. How do we, how do we get services and stuff to people who don't have access? So I know that we are not alone in that, and there's been leaps and bounds of growth and uh, grants we've received to get hotspots and stuff like that since that moment. But I think it became really obvious that we were essential, that libraries and library workers were essential during this time, because that's where um, I just remember hearing everybody say, I didn't realize how important the library was to our community until now. I was like, thank you. <laughs> now keep that feeling in your mind. <laughs> um, I've just been amazed though at the creative ways libraries have offered services like curbside service and crafts and lockers outside to access books and, and so much more. But we did it. We did it because that's what we do. We rise to the occasion and we figure out how to meet the needs of our community and where they're at. And I fully believe that that fools our fuels our ability to pivot. And that helps us in discovering and knowing our, our why, which is a really big thing that I want to talk about. So here are some pictures of just some programs that we've had at our library. The one in the middle, this little boy, he, I know you probably shouldn't have favorites at story time, but he's one of my favorites. <laughs> And I think I could tell you all there that because you're not in Oklahoma, but he, he started right when I started here and now he's in kindergarten and in school full time. So I don't get to see him every week. Like I used to, but, uh, I had, um, the privilege of attending our state's leadership Institute back in 2018. And we had to watch a lot of different leadership related videos in the weeks leading up to our actual Institute. And one of them was a TED talk about being able to say what you do in a few sentences and knowing your why. And I found that you need to revisit that why ever so often, especially during those hard days, those days uh, you just feel like you cannot talk to one more person. <laughs> you cannot make one more decision. Uh, you do not wanna plan another program that nobody shows up to. <laughs> Um, everyone's why will be different, but it will help fuel your passion for what you do. It's your motivator. And so I, I really had to revisit that during the last 18 months. And when I first started working at the Altus Public Library, there currently wasn't any teen programming. Um, and I wanted to start Teen Tuesday up. And again, I reach out to the ARSL listserv. I ask what other libraries are doing for teen programming. What's that look like for them? I was able to visit um, our schools and talk to uh, their fifth through eighth grade. Our schools are broken up into grade centers. So we have fifth and sixth grade and then seventh and eighth grade. And I was able to introduce myself, get their feedback. Like if I were to do programming, what would be interested? Like, what would you find interesting? Because what I think is cool and fun a fifth grader is probably not going to think it's cool and fun. And I felt like I got really good feedback. I was super pumped. I was excited. I planned programming, spent all this time prepping it, set it all up and nobody showed. And I was trying so hard not to be bummed, but nobody showed. And what was even harder, and I don't know if you've dealt with this, but when you're trying to change kind of the culture in your, um, in your workspace and your staff, especially staff who have worked there for a very long time and 
they're like, this isn't going to work. It hasn't worked in the past. Why are you doing all this work? It's not going to matter. It's not going to work. And that makes that really hard. But I do believe very strongly that you, you have to be that positive force, whether it's to your coworkers or to your staff, like well, we're going to try. And if it doesn't work, we'll pivot and we'll try something else. And we're going to try again because it, it may not work, but we won't know unless we try. And maybe it didn't work 10 years ago, but guess what? Our community is a lot different now than it was 10 years ago. So I tried again, a couple more programs, nobody showed up. So we kind of put a pause on it. Valentine's Day was coming up and I heard about another library doing this anti-Valentine's Day teen uh, party. And I thought, okay, well, that sounds fun. And may, you know, because Valentine's is full of all the couples and lovey-dovey. So this was supposed to be like, hey, you don't have to be a couple lovey-dovey, but just come have fun. We'll do some cookie decorating and other games and stuff. I was hoping that maybe five would show up and I had 20. I was like, what? I, I mean, like I was so, and what was fun is the staff were excited. They're like, oh, we have 20 teens here. What are we going to do? And, and, and that was that the, the picture in the bottom, I guess, it's, I don't know if it's showing left or right, but with the teens, you see the hearts on the wall. That was that. And I think we made slime and we had different things going on. And I was really, really excited. Well, this one boy comes up to me and he was like, and we, so we started having team Tuesday and I would have maybe like five, four to five come every week. And I was very happy with that. And sometimes if we did bigger programs, more would show up. And he came up to me one time. He's like, I am so glad that you have these team Tuesdays. I was like, Hey, thanks. He was like, I heard you speak at my school. And I'm sorry. I didn't come at first, but I couldn't get any friends to come with me. And I didn't want to come by myself, but I'm just happy that I have a place that I can get a snack after school and hang out. And I was just like, that is my why. Now I had to go through a little bit of disappointment and like pivoting and figuring out what to do different, but that's your why. So when you see that child's excitement to roll enroll in summer reading program or the first time that they earn a prize or that first time that the parent comes in and was like, oh, Thank you for recommending that book because it was a total disaster to try to get my child to read or the first time somebody figures out um, how to use the computer themselves. So now they feel empowered to go and apply for jobs or create a resume. Those are what fuels my why. So I really encourage you to take some time today, 10 minutes today, and, and think about your why. And I encourage you to ask your staff or your coworkers to do the same. Because, and, and then write it down. And I have a couple of things on my um, computer screen. It's just bullet point that I look at it every now and then. And I think, okay, that's why I'm doing this today. That's why I am serving our community because we're all human and we reach our limits sometimes. It, it happens. And so when you know your why, and, it, and maybe it changes over the years too, uh, that really helps you get through those times. And remember to take a deep breath and be kind to yourself because burnout, it happens. And I'm kind of curious who here has ever experienced burnout at some point during their career. Put it in the chat box or do the little thumbs up or raise a hand. Uh, yes. So I see in the chat, yes, lots of thumbs going up. Definitely. I didn't really understand what that was probably until maybe the last um, couple of years. I think we do so much on a daily basis in normal times that since uh, COVID and the pandemic has kind of hit us, there has been so much more. We're, we're constantly working and, and we don't even realize like, you know, we might have that mental fatigue, that empathy fatigue, decision fatigue. I didn't know that was a real thing until one day I remember my husband asking me something about dinner. And I just, I literally thought I cannot make another decision. I cannot make another decision today because there was like all these decisions that you're making throughout the day. And it was just a really zoom fatigue. Yes, Tammy. I mean, these are real things that I didn't have words for. And again, I, attended a round table that ARSL held. And I heard other librarians talking about the same thing. I was like, 
that's how I'm feeling. Cause I kind of was thought, I kind of thought, well, maybe I'm just being a slacker. Maybe I need to work harder or like, I shouldn't be feeling so tired. I don't know, but, or I just kind of had this like heavy feeling and I, I wasn't really sure why, but when I started hearing other people experiencing the same thing, that's when I realized one, we need to talk to one another because you're not alone. If you're feeling this, you, I can guarantee you the librarian in the next county or in another state is feeling the same thing. Or maybe they have felt that and they can say, hey, this is what helped me get through that. And this is what could possibly help you. So um, I, we, I flew to a couple of different conferences back in October, uh, the Iowa and the ARSL. And I remember, you know, when you're sitting in a plane and the attendant is uh, going through all the rules and information and she gets to the part in the case of emergency and the oxygen falls down um, and masks are released. And <laughs> what's funny is they now have to say, please remove your mask and then put your oxygen mask on. <laughs> Cause you know, we have to wear masks in a plane um, and airports. And so uh, we have to put ours on first before you help the person next to you. And I thought about that for a second and I kind of laughed out loud. Again, I told you I'm a little awkward and the flight attendant kind of gave me a mean stare. And I was like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not laughing at you. I'm thinking about uh, an analogy for I'm a librarian. And then I have to feel like I have to explain everything, but <laughs> that led to an awkward conversation and it was fine. <laughs> uh, but I started thinking, that is so true. If we do not take care of ourselves, um, no matter what you're doing in the library, if you do not take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of your patrons and your community? And if you're a director or a branch manager or a supervisor, how are you going to take care of your staff? And so I thought, man, because I always thought, well, I got to be the one that keeps going and going and going. But then I have nothing left to give, not only to my work, but to my family, to my friends. I mean, we do have lives outside of what we do. And I think, at least for me, sometimes that's hard to remember um, being in a small and rural community because we interact. Like I have people at Walmart it's like, hey, do you think you could return my book for me? And I'm like, no, I can't. And, you know, it's hard because you know these people in your daily lives, like some, sometimes it may not always be the case, but I realize we have to breathe and take time for ourselves. And that looks, that could look different for um, everybody. It might mean actually taking your lunch time. I remember for a whole year, I don't know if I actually took my scheduled lunch time because I thought, well, I, I've got a lot of that I got to do. And, um, and I remember also kind of feeling like they always take their lunchtime and their breaks. And then I thought, well, that's what they should do. And that's what we should want each other to do because, you know, I know there's times where maybe we can't, but that's taking time for yourself. So then you could come back to work refreshed and ready to go. Um, maybe it means taking an actual mental health day and vegging out on Netflix and eating lots of chocolate. I need to find healthier ways to have a mental health day, but I really like chocolate. Um, but I just want to encourage you to show each other grace and to show yourself grace when you are feeling this way, um, and set that example for your coworkers and set that example, uh, for one another, as far as I'm going to make sure I'm taking care of my mental health and myself so I can do be the, the very best for my community and for my patrons and for my staff. Um, so I'm going to share one of one of my favorite quotes I have discovered back in July, my husband and I, uh, we actually drove up to Wyoming. Uh, one of my friends was getting married who I'd met through ARSL and we've become really good friends and we decided to take a little road trip and, and, and attend that. And being the librarian I am, I insisted that we stop at all the small towns. And so I could take pictures in front of all the different libraries. And my husband was like, he works, he's a supervisor at the water treatment plant here. And he's like, I'm not taking pictures in front of the water treatment plants. Like, well, we can, they're probably not as pretty, but <laughs> we could do that. <laughs> so this is a little trip, a um, uh, little collage of some of the libraries that we stopped on along the way. One of the ones in Colorado that I stopped at, I think it's the Fraser Valley Library. Uh, a lady had overheard me kind of talking. So of course, if they were open, I would go in and look and maybe talk to whoever was working there. And she overheard me talking and she said, I thought you might be a librarian. When I drove up, I saw you taking a picture and I thought, 
probably only other librarians or people who work at libraries take pictures in front of libraries. It's like, yes. And we found out that we had a mutual friend through ARSL. And it was just one of those things like, ah, oh, that's so awesome. I feel like the library world, even though it's, there's, it's big, but it is also so small. And one of my favorite quotes is bad libraries build collections, good libraries build services, and great libraries build communities. So as you're thinking throughout the day, um, and you might be thinking about your why or and you're going through your daily tasks, just remember you are building up your community. Everything that you do, even the little things, the big things, uh, you're building up your community. And so I just wanna thank you all very much for your time this morning and uh, your interaction. Uh, here's just some of my favorite resources that I use. Um, uh, you can take a picture of that or whatever. And it's, uh, that, that is the end. I guess if we have any questions, I have my contact information at the end, but I'll leave the resource page up for a second. Do you mind if I share your slides with everyone? Oh, not at all. The link? Okay. So then they can get this information okay. off the slide. Oh, perfect. And there you are on TikTok, Bailey the Librarian. Yeah. And I think I think that's it. And you have the link for the slides, right? Did I send I do, it to you? I okay. do. If you wouldn't mind sending me the updated one, I think the other one still had the Iowa Library. Uh, association and for information. Yes, I, I can do that. And then that way, that would be easier to get that. Okay. And if um, anybody has any questions or stories they'd like to share or anything. I guess I remember um, when you and I, Bailey, did the mystery state game. Yes. Yes, that was fun. And that's another great thing about getting really familiar with Zoom and doing this is we've learned all these different ways we can partner with other libraries that are not in our state that don't require us to travel, that expose our kids to other kids in other parts of the country. And it's just really, that, that's really awesome. Yeah, this was for, before the pandemic. We Zoomed with one yeah. another and um, tried to guess just from questions what state the other one was from. And I have the question about sending it in for CE credit. It's probably easier if you send it in yourself. I was not able to get um, a list of who all is here or last names or libraries. So if you'd send it in CE credit yourself, it would work great. And Bailey, you're able to see the chat, right? Yeah, I was just going to say um, thank you so much. I Thank you all for letting me uh, speak to you and um, and yes, you're definitely not alone. <laughs> um, and that's, that's the great thing is just remembering that and, and, and also being able to find the, the chuckles and some of the things that maybe we have to deal with or, uh, the crazy things that happen in the library. It's funny for our last trails newsletter, um, the article I wrote was about programs. The only thing worse than planning a programming and having absolutely nobody come is having one person come because then you have a witness to your failure. Yeah. If comes, you can just, okay, never mind. But if one comes, you still have to go through the motions, even though it's not as rewarding to try to do something for just one person. Yeah. Sometimes it can feel awkward. Um, I see that as a new librarian, what are some ways to get familiar with the different areas? like children, 
Um, but I know for me personally, uh, since I, again, have only worked in small and rural libraries, I've had a very limited staff. So I've been the one that's in charge of children programming, teen programming. And again, I, I just, well, I would Google <laughs> story time ideas. And that one of the resources is Katie's story time for a full year or so, I would just go to her theme page and pretty much just use her outline. It really helps get used to what it meant to plan a story time, organize it and get used to children in that way. And then I would just reach out to other libraries and really utilize the ARSL listserv or maybe other libraries in your system uh, to get familiar with that. And then it was just the matter of doing it. Right, ask other librarians. Uh, there's, they are so willing to share. It's amazing. I've never seen a profession like that. Yes. And I remember asking, do you mind if I like use this template or something? And I was, I was really nervous to ask, but I thought, well, they've already created it. And it looks fantastic. Why would I go through the work of trying to recreate the same thing? And they're like, oh yeah, no, no problem. And so uh, it is, it's amazing how Willie and everyone's able to share what they've created and then giving them credit for that, you know, also. And sometimes it's hard to know where to, where to credit because they borrowed it from someone else who borrowed it from oh, someone yeah. else and just tweak it for their own. Yes. Yeah. I remember someone telling me that too, like, oh, I borrowed, the, I, I took this from some other library. Like I, you know, I don't care if you use it. I remember way back when I was a brand new librarian thinking, you know, what would be cool in here is Legos. I bet kids would love. And then I realized I was probably the only librarian in the whole state that didn't have Legos already. So it's hard to find any new ideas and that's okay because it yeah. can be new to you. Well, what's exciting is it is new to your community. I remember doing some different programming and people saying, wow, we've never done that before. And I, and, but I've gotten from all these other libraries who were doing it and doing it well. And so it's nice when somebody can share, well, this is what worked for us. And then this is what not worked for us. So it kind of helps your time that you're investing in that programming or idea. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, but it was so wonderful to have you here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Maybe I one of have a days, great week. One of these days in person. Yes. Well, thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you all.